everybody and welcome to this session which deals with the Netherlands, uh, the corporate tax system. Um, my name is Kees van Meel. I'm in the, um, uh, the Dutch desk in New York and I'm joined today in the presentation by Willem Hermans, who is a tax consultant in our international tax practice in Amsterdam. Uh, the agenda is as follows. We're going to start talking about uh, main tax features, uh, as you can see on slide three, and then uh, Willem will talk about uh, some things that are going to happen shortly, upcoming legislation. Uh, then we're going to talk about measures against uh, aggressive tax planning, and finally we'll talk about some planning techniques. So, to start with uh, <clears throat> the main uh, tax features of the Netherlands, uh, next slide you will see uh, the Netherlands, uh, you, well you will see, you will not see because the Netherlands is a, a tiny dot in the middle of this, uh, of this map, but it's, uh, as you can see, it's, um, um, it, it's in, in the middle of continental Western Europe, um, it's uh, within the 160 mile uh, or 300 mile radius, there's 160 million consumers. Uh, all the big uh, rivers, the, the, the Rhine and the Meuse, they all end in the Netherlands. So, dead hard in the center of Europe. And, uh, yeah, that gives uh, good reasons for, for trade and what have you. So, the next slide uh, gives you a little bit of more of a close-up on the Netherlands. Now, um, you, you will see the population of the Netherlands, 17 and a half million. In comparison, New York has 19 million. Very small country, 41,000 uh, square kilometers, 16,000 square miles. That's marginally bigger than the state of Maryland. Uh, capital is Amsterdam, as you know, and interestingly, two thirds of the Netherlands is below sea level. So if we stop pumping, we will drown. Um, historically, the Netherlands has been a small trading and seafaring nation with no big industrial bases. Um, in the in the late 1500s, the Dutch discovered a route to the to the Indies, the Dutch Indies and and, and British India, of course, and um, that uh, sort of opened the way to a lot of trade. Um, the uh, the Dutch uh, would build ships that would sail all the way to the Indies and around uh, around Africa and and bring back spices and what have you. Now th this was a very expensive and riskful uh, venue. So even, no matter how rich you were, if you would build a ship and it would go, it would go under, and uh, roughly one of five wouldn't come back, you would be bankrupt. And to to sort of fix that, uh, what people did, they they joined together and said, okay, we all take the risk for a ship. And uh, so they they shared the risk and they shared the ships, and that sort of was the basis for the first uh, share company and multinational in the world. The VOC, the Dutch East Indies Company, which was incorporated in 1602 and had 28,000 employees. So um, this all um, sort of reflects on the on, on the tax system of the Netherlands. You don't, if you are a small trading nation, you don't want any legal and tax hindrances like withholding taxes, credit restrictions, uh, double taxation, and and what have you. On top of that, uh, we don't want the government to be involved in what uh, what would be an arm's length profit historically because the good merchant would know how to deal with this and uh, and do business and, 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 and make money and if you didn't do that you would go bankrupt which would follow you for the rest of your life so we're now coming to a, a general overview of the over the corporate tax system um, the statutory rate uh, is 25 percent and then you have a first bracket of currently 245,000 euros going up to 295,000 for next year, which is taxed at a rate of 15%. Uh, of um, the most famous feature of the Dutch tax system was the 100% participation exemption, uh, means that dividends and capital gains uh, from qualifying subsidiaries is not, not taxed in the Netherlands. Uh, there's no stamp duties, there's no capital contribution tax, and historically, like I mentioned, uh, no withholding on interest, royalties, and technical fees, because that would just hinder business. But, um, and, and we will come to that in the, in the rest of our presentation, uh, uh, over recent years, uh, the perceived anti-abuse has has come um, uh, yeah, uh, in, in, in the 
public in the public view uh, a lot of people are talking about it so uh, we have this year 2021 introduced a conditional withholding tax uh, equal to the corporate tax rate on interest and royalty payments to affiliates in, in tax haven blacklisted jurisdiction uh, case of abuse and what have you dividend withholding tax on distribution is 15 percent uh, often lowered uh, under a tax treaty, the Netherlands has a large number of tax treaties, or under a domestic exemption, uh, the Dutch Dividend Withholding Tax Act provides for uh, zero withholding on dividends to a qualifying 5% or more parent that is located in the treaty country, irrespective of the, the rate in the treaty. So a Netherlands-Canada treaty provides for 5%, but uh, a dividend uh, to a, a Canadian parent company uh, subject to zero withholding on the domestic exemption. Uh, like I mentioned, a big treaty network. Uh, on top of that, EU directives that reduce uh, withholding taxes and uh, a lot of bilateral investment treaties. Uh, those really work. Um, the famous example is a, a U.S. Uh, oil multinational held a Venezuelan subsidiary through a Dutch company. Uh, the Venezuelan subsidiary was expropriated and the international courts uh, uh, found uh, that uh, Venezuela could not do that under the uh, bilateral investment treaty between the Netherlands and Venezuela. And Venezuela obviously um, immediately terminated the treaty, but um, as a matter of attention, those things do work and they're very efficient. Um, also, um, well known in the Netherlands is the, the ruling practice. You can, if you have a, uh, a fact pattern or you want to have an agreement uh, on whether the prices you charge are at arm's length, you can go to the Dutch tax inspector and present the facts, substantiate them, and if they agree, they will, will confirm it in, in an ATR or an APA, uh, which is typically valid for five years, and uh, that gives you certainty in advance. For um, uh, activities related to uh, R&D, we have an innovation box facility. Um, if you qualify, uh, you will first of all get uh, a reduction of the wages tax that you have to submit. Uh, so that's a wage tax incentive. And on top of that, any IP, qualifying IP you, um, you create um, income from that will be subject to a, a tax rate of 9% as, uh, as of this year. There's a, a group consolidation regime, we'll talk about it later, and functional currency uh, regime. So if you do your business predominantly, say, in US dollars, your Dutch uh, subsidiary can make an election to use the US dollar as its functional currency. Uh, loss carry back, um, currently one year carry back and six year carry forward. As of next year, um, there will be unlimited carry forward, um, but the amount of losses you can forward to one year uh, unconditionally is only 1 million, and then for the remainder, only 50% can be offset against uh, the taxable profits, and it applies both carry back and carry forward. So you have to pay a, a little bit of tax in those situations. Let's um, uh, go to um, this slide. It, it gives you a sort of a, a general idea of how the Netherlands has historically been used in international uh, structures. And you see here a, a Dutch uh, holding company that is held by a foreign parent. The Dutch company has subsidiaries. It has a foreign branch. So um, it also uh, provides uh, financing and uh, it, it uh, provides IP to affiliates. So there's a whole flow of, um, of funds going through the Netherlands. It will receive interest, uh, royalties and dividends, and it will pay interest, royalty and dividends. Um, under the participation exemption, the, uh, the dividends and the capital gains with respect to the subsidiaries, like I previously mentioned, are, um, are to totally exempt. We talked about the big treaty network, uh, no withholding tax on interest and royalties and dividends uh, received under those treaties, at least no withholding or substantially reduced withholding, and also on outgoing payments, assu assuming that the anti-abuse rules I previously discussed uh, do, not, uh, do not apply. Um, participation exemption with respect to low-tax portfolio um, subsidiaries 
is an issue. Um, but what you used to do in the past is to hide them under an active company because the participation exemption is determined at the level of the direct subsidiary. And if that on balance is active, then you can have a portfolio subsidiary under that. As of 2019, we introduced CFC rules and that makes it a little bit more difficult. You can still do it, uh, but you uh, would have to take the funds out of the subsidiary because the CFC rules say that if you have low tax portfolio income in a foreign subsidiary that you are immediately taxed in the Netherlands irrespective of those whether those dividends have been distributed. It's sort of akin to the, to the US rules. Finally, uh, a quick word about um, the Dutch uh, fiscal unity rules. Um, under, under the Netherlands, uh, that's a slide nine, um, entities that are at least 25% owned by a Dutch parent company can be included in a, in a fiscal unity uh, with their Dutch parent company. Uh, the fiscal unity is, is a tax group, balance sheets and profits are consolidated and the group files one single uh, corporate tax return and losses within the fiscal unity, loss and profits can be set off against each other um, and uh, finally application can be made on a company by company basis and that's a little bit different from the US because the US has more or less an automatic tax group and in the Netherlands you have to, uh, to apply for it. And if you look at the, 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 the picture below, it shows you basically what it does. On the left hand, you see Dutch BV1 has a profit of 100. BV2 has a loss of 100. Uh, without a fiscal unity, BV1 pays 25 uh, tax and BV2 pays no tax and has on the tax loss carry forward. On the right hand, you see that in, within the fiscal unity, the, uh, the profit and the loss are offset. So in other words, no, uh, no tax due uh, immediately. Um, not only um, uh, a Dutch parent can create a fiscal unity um, under EU case law, you can also have a fiscal unity if an EU parent company owns 95% or more of two Dutch sister companies. In that case, uh, they, um, they can file um, a fiscal unity return and one of the subsidiaries will then be the, the, the surrogate parent and will file the, the Dutch consolidated return. There's also a, a, a hopscotch fiscal unity. So you have a Dutch parent and say an EU subsidiary, which in its turn has a Dutch subsidiary. In that case, on basis of case law, uh, that's the Papillon case, you can also have a fiscal unity between those companies. That's it in, in very quickly, very quick introduction on the Dutch uh, tax system. And now Willem uh, will take us uh, through some upcoming and proposed legislation. Willem? Yes. Many thanks, Case. Uh, we'll now have a closer look on what will change as of 2022. Um, at the day of our recording, the Netherlands just had presented uh, its tax plan 2022. Um, but since the Dutch government is discharged, uh, the announced measures are relatively modest compared to previous years. Nevertheless, there are interesting developments which are relevant to international businesses. And the remainder of this part of the presentation will focus on these two developments, which are the draft bill on combating, combating mismatches in the application of the armed length principle and on the draft legislation on reverse hybrid entities becoming fully subject to Dutch corporate income tax. However, before we discuss those uh, developments, an interesting and very relevant side note is that after the 2022 tax plan was presented, the coalition par parties of the Dutch government have reached an agreement resulting into an amendment package. Uh, this includes uh, the tightening of the earnings stripping rules. Following 8 at 1 implementation, all EU countries should now have earnings stripping rules in place and the current Dutch earnings stripping rules limit the interest deductions insofar net interest expense, which means interest expenses minus interest income, exceed the highest of 1 million or 30% of fiscal EBITDA. The proposed change would, however, decrease the threshold percentage of EBITDA from 30% to 20%. So yeah, that's of course a very significant drop and uh, important to be aware of. And in addition, the government has also announced to increase the headline corporate income tax rate with 0.8 percentage points from 25% to 
Um, although the formal amendments have not yet been publish, published, these changes are expected to apply as of 1 January 2022. Um, so with that, go to the uh, first topic and have a closer look on the amendment of the arm length principle uh, to prevent transfer pricing mismatches. Some background, the arm length principle basically has always been part of the Dutch tax system meaning that benefits derived by Dutch companies that have their origin in shareholder relationships are eliminated from taxable profit calculation. However, due to different interpretations of the arm length principle among jurisdictions or due to the absence of transfer price legislation at all, uh, Dutch TP adjustment can result in a downward adjustment of profits uh, irrespective of whether the country of the related party applies a corresponding upward adjustment typically known as a transfer pricing mismatch. On our budget day of last year in 2020, uh, the government already announced that it would tackle transfer pricing mismatches by not applying the arm length principle if and to the extent there is no corresponding upward adjustment uh, in the jurisdiction of the counterparty. And now one year later, uh, we have the draft legislation and we see that uh, the Dutch government kept its promise and we see that the draft legislation con basically consists of three elements. Um, the first element basically says that taxable profit for Dutch purposes can no longer be adjusted downwards if the taxable profit or other, um, sorry, if the taxable profit of the other uh, group company is not adjusted upwards as well. We'll shortly see an example on how this exactly works. The second element relates to a new limitation regarding the onshoring of assets from group companies to the Netherlands. As of 2022, the Netherlands will only provide for a step up if the corresponding upward adjustment uh, has been included in the taxable profit base of the transferor. And we note here that also deposits in kind of an assets, which could lead to similar mismatches, uh, although this is not a transfer pricing mismatch, but more of a valuation mis mismatch, would in a similar manner, but by a separate provision, also be captured by this proposal. Uh, then the third element, um, this is a restrictive measure regarding depreciation of assets that were uh, acquired from related entities in financial years that have started on or after 1 July 2019 until 1 January 2022. To the extent that an asset is still uh, depreciated, at the beginning of 2022, uh, there will be a limit on depreciation. And also here we will see, uh, see an example. Uh, it should be noted here that due to the third element, the proposal does gain, contains a de facto uh, retroactive effect. And uh, also a technical difference between two and three is that a mismatch captured under element two um, lowers the book value, whereas a mismatch captured on the element three only lowers the amount of depreciation by application of law. Uh, the de facto retroactive effect have been heavily criticized in the tax literature and also by the government's advisory body, yet the lawmaker has indicated that it prioritized its fight against aggressive tax planning over the principle of legal certainty in this case, and also due to earlier announcement, uh, the legislature said that taxpayers could have known that action was coming. If we then go to the first example, uh, we see a Dutch BV receiving a loan from its parent, principal amount is 100, and no interest is agreed. However, uh, the arm length interest rate would have been 5%. Prior to the application of the bill, the Netherlands would make a TP correction and impute 5 as a cost for the calculation of the BV's taxable base, whereas at the level of the parent co, no corresponding adjustment would have been made either due to a different interpretation or due to the absence of TP legislation. Now, as of 2022, uh, the Netherlands would deny the deduction of the arm's length interest of five, uh, as a result uh, of which there is no longer a transfer pricing mismatch. For the sake of completeness, we notice here that if parent co and BV1 commercially would have agreed on a 5% uh, interest rate, but the interest payment would not have been subject to tax at the level of the parent co, either due to the absence of a corporate income tax or due to the fact that the parent is uh, exempt of corporate income tax for whatever reason. 
this draft bill does not prevent the interest deduction since it's only targeted at transfer pricing adjustments. Then the next example, we see uh, Dutch BV acquiring an asset in its financial year 2020 uh, from its parents and agreed on a price of 500, whereas the fair market value of the asset was 1,000. Uh, prior to the enactment of this bill, the Dutch BV would capitalize the asset for 1,000 on its balance sheet and assume that the asset has a useful life of five, five years, uh, it would depreciate 200 each year. However, due to the application of the new legislation, uh, the amount of depreciation will be calculated on the basis of the transfer price and not on the at arm's length price. Uh, because the state of the transfer did not make a corresponding upwards adjustment upon the sale of the asset. In other words, for the Netherlands to accept the higher uh, depreciation, a difference between the fair market value and the book value should have been subject to tax in the jurisdiction of the transferor. Um, the f this means that uh, the depreciation in our example will be limited to 100. So that, that about it, about the... Uh, adjustment of the arm length principle brings us to the next topic uh, we wanted to discuss today, uh, which is the final piece of Dutch ETA 2 implementation resulting in a tax liability for reversed hybrid entities. Uh, first, what is a reverse hybrid entity? We can break that down into three different parts. First, it has to be a partnership entered into under Dutch law or established in the Netherlands. Secondly, it must be regarded as transparent for, the, for Dutch tax purposes prior to the application of this bill. And last, uh, the 50% of the voting rights, capital interest or profit rights are directly or indirectly held by one or more associated enterprises with the partnership, which are established in a state that regard the entity as an independent taxpayer, being non-tax transparent. In a U.S.-Netherlands relationship, this typically refers to a CV that is transparent for Dutch tax purposes, but treated as a corporation for U.S. federal income tax purposes. If the U.S. in that situation would hold at least 50% in the CV, the CV would thus become subject to corporate tax in the Netherlands. Uh, to the extent that there are other participants in the Dutch partnership, uh, the relevant part is deductible for Dutch corporate income tax purposes by virtue of law. If the uh, participants consider the Dutch hybrid entity as transparent and thus and, and this pick up the income. We'll have a look uh, at an example to further elaborate on this uh, a little bit more. Yeah, so here we see a US Co that sees the hybrid entity as transparent and uh, B as non transparent. Um, yeah, as a result, we meet all the criteria. Uh, because NL Hybrid uh, has been established under Dutch law and was transparent before the application of the law and at least 50% interest is held by a jurisdiction that considers the partnership as non-transparent. Uh, and as a result, the NL Hybrid will become subject to tax uh, against and the, the royalty income of 100 would in principle be subject to corporate tax but as said, uh, to the extent that the shares, the, the interest is held by a jurisdiction that considers the NL hybrid as transparent as well, a deduction is given by virtue of law, so the taxable income of the NL hybrid would only be 50 in this case. Uh, the third part of the presentation, we will focus on measures against aggressive tax planning, and we have selected three topics in this regard. Uh, the first one is the conditional withholding tax on interest and royalties. The ETA 2 implementation and DAC 6 rules. And as you can already see on the screen, we will start with the Dutch conditional withholding tax on interest and royalties. Uh, this was introduced as the beginning of 2021. And the reason for implementing the new tax is very clear. The Netherlands is seeking to improve its international tax reputation by introducing measures to combat its use as gateway to low tax jurisdictions. And the new withholding tax thus marks a departure from the Netherlands' traditional policy by not imposing withholding tax on outgoing interest and royalty payments, as case explained in the introduction. In essence, the law provides for withholding tax to be levied on interest and royalties paid by a Dutch resident withholding agent to affiliated entities established in low-tax jurisdictions, 
as well as in situations involving abuse or involving hybrid entities. Now, we realize that we have used a lot of terms and definitions in just one sentence, and we will elaborate a bit more on these and thereafter give some examples. A jurisdiction is considered low tax if it's included on either the EU list of non-cooperative jurisdictions or on the Dutch domestic list of non-cooperative jurisdictions, which is generally the case is that if that jurisdiction has a statutory rate of less than 9%. The Dutch list is annually updated on the 1st of October and is applicable to the following year, meaning that if a jurisdiction is listed on October 2021, it will apply to interest and royalty payments in 2022. Another key factor is that the withholding tax applies only to affiliated entities, um, and entities are affiliated if there is a qualifying interest, and this means that there is a direct or indirect influence on the decision-making process, such that the activities of uh, the entity can be uh, determined. As mentioned, the uh, tax rate is linked to the highest corporate income tax rate, so as of 2022, this should also be higher from 25 to 25.8%. Let's now have a look on uh, examples on the next slide. On example one, we see a U.S. entity that holds all the shares in a BV, and the U.S. entity avails itself of a permanent establishment in a low-tax jurisdiction. A direct payment from BV to U.S. would be out of scope uh, because the U.S. is not classified as low-tax, but this is different when the U.S. entity attributes the income to a permanent establishment in a low-tax jurisdiction. So in this case, the Netherlands would levy a withholding tax. The question would, of course, be whether the Netherlands could effectuate its domestic tax under the U.S.-Netherlands Treaty, uh, which would, among others, uh, depend on the Limitation on Benefit Clause. Um, but that discussion uh, is, of course, depending on the facts and circumstances and beyond the scope of this presentation. Then the second uh, practical example, we see payments that are rooted uh, via a high-tax jurisdiction to a low-tax jurisdiction. And, yeah, of course, if this wouldn't be subject to tax, it would be very easy to circumvent the uh, conditional withholding tax. So there are anti-abuse measures uh, which uh, disregard the non-low-tax jurisdiction uh, if it's abusive. And a construction is considered abusive if both the subjective test and the objective test fail. First, have a look at the subjective test. An assessment should be made uh, of the Dutch withholding tax position if the paying entity will look through the underlying recipient. So if a direct payment to that entity would be subject to taxes, the subjective, tax, uh, subjective test is not met. And applying this in this case, uh, you see clearly that the subjective test is not met because if it wouldn't pay directly to the underlying participant, uh, the payment would have been subject to tax. So then we look at the second escape possibility, the objective tax test. Uh, that is uh, met if there is relevant substance at the level of the uh, direct investor who receives the payment. And the objective test may be met if the USCO in this case meets all the relevant substance requirements. Uh, we, we have a list for that, but uh, due to the ECJ Dennis case, cases of February 2019, Substance requirements are no longer applied as a safe harbor, but merely play a role in the distribution on the burden of proof. Um, so whether in this case withholding taxes are due depends on the amount of relevant substance at the level of the U.S. Co. Then the last example involving a hybrid entity. Uh, we can also run into the uh, interest royalty withholding tax issues uh, because the Netherlands would classify based on its foreign entity classification rules, the LLC as transparent, whereas for US FIT, the LLC would be disregarded. Uh, so we have a hybrid entity and, and the payments could be subject to withholding taxes because uh, there is no escape because there are no underlying participants in this, in this example who can pick up the income. Um, we note here that we note here that despite the fact that the payment is also not deductible based on Dutch ETA 2 rules because you have a deduction non-inclusion, uh, 
the Dutch withholding tax would apply uh, anyways. So regardless whether the payment is tax deductible for corporate income tax purposes. So yeah, we briefly mentioned the ETA2 rules, also known as the hybrid mismatch rules. Uh, they were introduced with effect of January 2020 and aim to combat the arrangement that exploit differences in tax treatments of entities or instruments under the law of two or more jurisdictions. Uh, such differences may, if left unaddressed, result in double deductions uh, or deduction non-inclusions. So basically, ATA2 ends all the double, uh, double dips, triple dips, deductions, non-inclusions, deductible dividends, etc. All that stuff is targeted under ATAT. Uh, which again is summarized on the next slide. Uh, as such, it's of course not a problem that the dual deductions and the deduction non-inclusion situations are targeted by ATAT, but the implementation under circumstances has unintended and unperceived overkill, which may have very nasty consequences for the taxpayers in case, which we'll see on the example on the next slide. We see a US parent entity who has made a check the box election on his Dutch sub and the Dutch subsidiary performs contract manufacturing activities for its US parent uh, and is re remunerated on a cost plus basis. The Dutch subsidiary makes a uh, hundred of cost as depicted uh, on the slide and these costs are also uh, deductible in the US because the Dutch subsidiary is a branch. Uh, so we clearly have a dual deduction here targeted under ETA 2 rules. In this case, the only income that the Dutch subsidiary receives is a cost plus remuneration and this payment is disregarded for US fit purposes and therefore there is no dual inclusion income, so we don't have an escape. All European countries are struggling with this scenario, but there is good news in this regard. Uh, the Dutch le legislator in a decree following the United Kingdom and Ireland has approved that if PV would have had two participants, being a US partnership, there is under conditions dual inclusion income at the level of the US partnership and therefore the cost could be deductible again in the Netherlands. The decree also note that cross-border tax con consolidation regimes can lead to double deduction non-inclusion outcomes. However, it gives an example with a US REIT US subsidiary thereof and a Dutch shop subsidiary uh, and explains that in that case also dual inclusion income could arise. So also for US REIT, it had two problems are alleviated in the Netherlands. Then the last topic, last but not least for this part of the presentation is tax six. Instead of going uh, to the basic rules of tax six, we assume that our audience has a bit of background, uh, so we'll not go to the hallmarks again, but instead want to tackle two general misconceptions uh, that we believe are important to address. Uh, the first misconception is that tax six only applies to intermediaries, and the second misconception is that tax six only applies to aggressive tax planning schemes. It's indeed true that reporting obligations are in principle with the intermediaries involved, but there are multiple situations where the uh, reporting obligation can shift to the relevant taxpayer if the relevant taxpayer is an EU tax resident. The first situation would be if there's no intermediary involved and the taxpayer would develop a scheme that is reportable in-house. Uh, then the taxpayer herself has to do the reporting. The second situation would be if there is an intermediary, but that intermediary lacks EU nexus, for example, KPMG US. Also then, the relevant taxpayer must report herself. Then the third situation, if the intermediary has EU nexus, um, still the relevant taxpayer has to report, because if the intermediary is legal, uh, has a legal professional privilege, then it only has a notification obligation and not a reporting obligation, which means that they must inform the client that there is a reporting obligation, but not make the reporting uh, itself. So plenty of situations where uh, the reporting obligation can shift to the taxpayer. Then the second misconception that tax six should only apply to aggressive tax planning schemes. 
on the next slide we see an example where a US co parent uh, transfers an asset to a NLDRE. And yeah, that arrangement is clearly cross border since we have an EU participant being the NL disregard and a third country uh, participant, US co. So uh, the hallmarks must have been checked. And the hallmark applicable to this asset transfer uh, would be hallmark C4. Uh, because for the Netherlands, we see a transfer against far, ma far market value coming in, whereas uh, for US tax purposes, you don't see a transfer at all uh, because it's a transfer to itself, it's a transfer to a US branch. Uh, this is enough to trigger Hallmark C4. Uh, C4 says if there is a material difference in the amount being treated as payable in consideration for the asset in the jurisdictions involved, then Hallmark C4 is triggered. And Hallmark C4 is not linked to the main benefit test. So we do not have an escape here by saying that the arrangement was not tax driven at all. Um, so also vice versa would apply if the Netherlands would transfer to the US, uh, there would also be a reporting obligation for the NLDRE. Um, yeah, severe penalties are in place. Um, so it's important to Keep track of your DAC 6 reporting obligations. So um, that, that brings us to the end of, uh, of uh, our pr presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. And um, so on behalf of Willem and me, and um, goodbye.